My topic uh, today is bleeding disorders in children. And uh, the first slide shows an outline of the presentation. I will begin with a primer on basic coagulation and flowing blood, and then uh, discuss three major conditions seen in pediatrics, von Willebrand disease, the hemophilias A and B, acute ITP. I'll then review considerations in the differential diagnosis of each of these, uh, of each of these entities. Uh, uh, next, we'll review the effects on coagulation of hypoxia, acidosis, and hypothermia, as seen from the standpoint of trauma medicine, where bleeding is a major cause of early death. And then finally, there will be a brief summary. The first slide is a micrograph um, uh, showing uh, a high power of a micrograph showing a peripheral blood smear. Normally, the red cells have a normal architecture, are free of fragmentation or tearing, as one can see in disseminated intravascular coagulation. The platelets number 8 to 10 per high powered field, such as this one, and are of normal size, which means they usually are a quarter of the red cell diameter or less. Blood clotting is generally considered to occur in two. Uh, uh, major uh, uh, phases. One, the so-called extrinsic system represented by the yellow circle or yellow oval, where factor seven, uh, tissue factor, and the common final pathway factors five, two, and ten all lead to the formation of a fibrin clot. Uh, the prothrombin time best characterizes uh, the time it takes for the extrinsic clotting system to activate clotting. In contrast, on the left side of the slide is the so-called intrinsic system. Intrinsic because it's thought, or at one time was thought, the, that the blood itself was sufficient to, to trigger clotting. And this includes the hemophilioid factors, and again, the final common pathway factors of 2, 5, and 10. The partial thromboplastin time measures the intactness of this uh, alternative pathway to the generation of a fibrin clot. But coagulation proteins aren't the whole story, but instead the blood platelet is quite important. And here we see a blood platelet in flowing blood is initially adhered or ensnared, if you will, by the interaction between its glycoprotein 1B, and that is a receptor on the platelet, and the von Willebrand factor on the vessel wall. This initial attachment is consolidated, that is made more uh, uh, firm and long-lasting by a second interaction involving the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor, otherwise known as the fibrinogen receptor, fibrinogen being a key adhesive protein. This allows platelets to cohere to one another, as well as uh, uh, better cohere to the vessel wall. <clears throat> in reality, clotting factors are not activated in a plasma phase, but rather always on lipid surfaces of cells, such as the endothelial cell, the blood platelet, or the leukocyte, and in rare cases, even the red cell. An example here is tissue factor, uh, which can be expressed on endothelium following exposure of the vessel wall to cytokines. <clears throat> the tissue factor will then bind with circulating factor 7 uh, to form the, the tissue factor, factor 7, a surface active enzyme complex. This complex in turn can activate circulating factor 10 or circulating factor 9 to active forms, which downstream leads to thrombin generation and uh, instigation of a plated fibrin thrombus, either on a damaged vessel wall or, as shown here, even on intact uh, vascular endothelium. Now, I like to make a distinction between what goes on in arteries versus veins. In arterial hemostasis, one sees principally platelets and fibrin, and this condition is associated with high, that is, arterial-like blood flow velocity gradients, whereas venous hemostasis involves very few red, uh, platelets, rather, and is primarily red cells and fibrin. This type of hemostasis is associated with low, that is, venous blood flow velocity gradients. And in between is a spectrum. These represent extremes of, a, in reality, a continuum. Now, red blood cell motions in the shear field become quite important because it is these motions which allow blood platelets to better access the vessel wall and to make platelets a, a principal constituent of thrombi in, at high velocity gradients uh, seen in arterioles and arteries. In the microscopic world, uh, red cells will experience a, a different flow velocity on one side versus the other. Here, the length of flow 
uh, of the arrows represents the magnitude of flow velocity moving from the vessel wall and out into the flow stream. And here a red blood cell will experience a greater flow velocity on this side of it than on that one. This gives rise to a sort of tumbling motion of the red cell, which in turn leads to small-scale motions of the surrounding plasma, uh, which in turn allows the plate to move across streamlines in either direction. But in effect, gives rise to a type of, we'll call it a diffusivity for the platelet, about 100 times greater than that due to Brownian motion uh, for a particle or object the size of the platelet. Shear rates vary in the circulation, such that in arteries and arterioles, they're uh, the highest magnitude of the order of many hundreds to thousands of inverse seconds. Uh, but in contrast, in the veins and, and venules, uh, the shear rates are quite low. Uh, some years ago, I devised an experiment to help better show the role of uh, shear rate in driving plated uh, hemostasis or even plated thrombosis. And here we had a plated agonist ADP uh, diffuse uh, into a flow, a flow system with whole blood, and the diffusion was through a dialysis membrane, but in such a way that we could fix the rate of ADP entry without disturbing the flow. An important consideration. Uh, flow rate can be varied independently of the rate of ADP entry. And here we show that as one increases the rate of delivery of fresh platelets by the flow, one would say by convection and diffusion, that the rate of platelet aggregation increases accordingly. That is, increasing the delivery of platelets increases the amount of platelets seen on a dialysis membrane. Conversely, if one were to extrapolate the zero shear rate, there is no aggregation occurring, no plate of th uh, hemostasis occurring, even though the rate of ADP entry remains finite. What this is saying is that platelet platelet collisions and platelet interactions with that vessel wall, driven by flow forces, are crucial to the formation of a platelet plug under uh, conditions of most uh, arteries and arterioles. In more recent studies, <clears throat> we've expended, extended our experiments to include whole blood but now with the capability to use epifluorescence video microscopy to look at single platelets adhering to either intact endothelium or to adsorbed uh, microfibular collagen. Here we have a micrograph of a perfusion fixed uh, surface of the glass showing platelet aggregates uh, leaning away from the flow direction, which is from left to right. The smallest object is a single platelet, and this again is a large aggregate measuring perhaps 50 to 70 mi 75 microns uh, in extent. The strands are platelet fibrils. Now in whole blood, uh, we're looking now through the glass, at the, uh, just through the layer of collagen at where blood first interacts with the collagen. Blood flow has been reversed by the camera. It's from top to bottom. The smallest objects are single platelets. What one can see is that uh, platelet adhesion aggregation is indeed a dynamic process. And the color coding gives us an idea of the thickness locally, yellow and white being the, the thickest, and the dark blues being the thinnest. In contrast, once again, under very slow flow conditions, red cells tend to form stacks, uh, which were likened uh, years ago to, uh, to rouleau, uh, little, little rolls or coin-like stacks. This is because of attractive forces between red cells, which are only prevalent or important under very low shear conditions. It's easy to see how such red cell rouleau, together with fiber formation, can lead to the red blood clot seen here in the very dilated coronary arteries of a child who had Kawasaki disease. Red cells are also important in vivo. And in this example, we have a number of patients with renal failure uh, who had prolonged bleeding times, a measure of coagulation we rarely use today. And one can see that the bleeding time is, in the most part, corrected by simple transfusion of packed red blood cells. In other words, the presence of the red blood cells here is key to, to uh, having normal hemostasis. Now I'd like to move on to von Willebrand disease. Von Willebrand disease is perhaps the most common inherited bleeding condition, although its, its prevalence is uh, controversial. Perhaps about one person in a thousand in a general population has the condition. It's characterized by nosebleeds, easy bruising, bleeding after dental extraction or other gingival bleeding, heavy periods, uh, bleeding following trauma or surgery, postpartum bleeding, or even gastrointestinal tract bleeding. 
The von Willebrand factor itself is an adhesion protein. Uh, we, we saw in an earlier slide how it was important to allow platelets to connect with and adhere to damaged vessel wall. It's a polypeptide synthesized in and secreted by both endothelial cells and megakaryocytes. It's found in the vessel wall on endothelium and plated alpha granules as well as in the circulation. It can polymerize into so-called multimers consisting of up to 100 subunits with a total molecular weight uh, approaching uh, the 20 million uh, Dalton range. It's now recently been found that it travels rolled up like a spool of yarn, but shear stresses, again, the importance of flow forces, or engaging with a vessel wall in the presence of shear stresses allows it to unravel into a sticky thread longer than even an endothelial cell. And the thread, of, of course, is sticky to platelets, facilitating hemostasis. The test panel that uh, one normally orders to make a diagnosis includes a level of factor eight, a functional measure of the von Willebrand factor called risk of seed and cofactor activity, and an antigen of the von Willebrand factor, an antigenic determination of how much is present. And there's two major assays or types of assays used to accomplish this. A measure of, of circulating fibrinogen, a blood type of the patient, and on occasion, gene sequencing looking for specific mutations in the von Willebrand factor gene. Uh, items two and three are measures of von Willebrand factor function. Factor eight is stabilized by von Willebrand factor there's no intrinsic defect in von Willebrand's disease in factor VIII, but its half-life is much affected by the intactness and function of the von Willebrand protein. We measure fibrinogen as a built-in control because if it's elevated, the fibrinogen suggests that there may be an inflammatory state present in the patient, and the values for the von Willebrand parameters may be elevated above their true baseline. And the reason for this is that they are, unfortunately, acute phase reactants. Uh, normal ranges vary by blood type. And one can see here that for blood type O, the average value for the von Willebrand factor antigen is only about 75%. And it becomes important, therefore, to use blood type specific normal ranges in making a correct diagnosis. Age is also a factor, and at levels in a newborn, are about 200% of adult levels, and but decline in the first six months of life to reach a meter, and then rise slowly at a rate of about 1% a year uh, for the remainder of life. In 2008, the National Heart, Blood, and Lung Institute initiated guidelines uh, for the diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease because of the great controversy that's existed and still exists to some degree as to who really has the disease. The guidelines were necessary because many people in the general population have bleeding symptoms but don't really have a bleeding disorder. Conversely, uh, we need to establish some reasonable criteria for people who might otherwise uh, bleed excessively at times of surgery or trauma, especially uh, surgery or trauma involving the airway. So the guidelines stated, number one, that one can be considered to have mild von Willebrand's disease if one had a risk of Seton or von Willebrand factor antigen level of less than 50%, plus a personal or family history of bleeding. Or secondly, a risk of Seton or von Willebrand factor antigen level less than 30% without or with a personal or family history of bleeding. We note that uh, this history is not so germane to children, especially children under age, say 12 to 15, because such children often have had enough hemostatic challenges, bumps, bruises, surgical events to provide a meaningful personal bleeding history. So often we are left to be dependent upon uh, our intuition and family history. An important consideration with regard to flow conditions came from Dr. Harvey Weiss, an eminent hematologist uh, who practiced in New York, and that is he showed that shear rate uh, determines the relative importance, a relative uh, effect uh, that uh, one has uh, with an intact glycoprotein 1b von Willebrand factor interaction. And that is, if one plots the plated deposition, in his case on rabbit subendothelium versus velocity gradient, normals behave like this, much like the diagram or figure I showed earlier. And uh, whereas if one had von Willebrand's disease, here's two different patients, as one increases shear rate, there's actually a decline in adhesion aggregation meaning that a defective von Willebrand factor did not permit the kind of adhesion 
that one would normally expect to see at velocity gradients in the several thousands. Uh, put it another way, uh, high shear rate brings out a defect in von Willebrand's disease, which may not be obvious at very low shear rates. And this uh, underscores a difficulty with present-day diagnosis and that present clotting, uh, present tests to diagnose von Willebrand's disease are generally performed under static conditions, not under the true shear conditions in which uh, the underlying factor needs to exercise its uh, action on the blood platelet. So this brings us to the question, why do children with erythrocetin cofactor activity, that is functional von Willebrand factor level of 40% have bleeding events, whereas someone with he severe hemophilia A or B who's given an infusion of clotting factor concentrate to a 40% level is considered just fine for surgery? And the answer is, uh, uh, unfolds as follows. Firstly, the risk of seed and cofactor activity is measured under static conditions, as I just stated, whereas functional von factor matters under high shear stress conditions in which very large multimer unfolding and therefore platelet function is promoted. The answer is that, uh, again, is that the risk of seed and cofactor activity should actually be measured under a specified condition of shear stress, which is presently not the case. Factor 8 or factor 9 activity, as in the hemophilias, uh, on the other hand, matters even when blood flow is nearly absent. Now, von Willebrand's disease is classified into roughly three different types. Type 1, in which there's a decrease in both the function and the quantity of the von Willebrand factor. <clears throat> uh, type 2, or several type 2s, in which there's a mild and moderate decrease in the uh, high molecular weight multimers but usually an intact amount of, of uh, von Willebrand factor. And type 3, where both the function and the amount are severely decreased. Uh, this condition, while rare, uh, can lead to very significant bleeding, uh, much like that of the severe hemophiliac. Now, type 2 has a number of subtypes. We expand upon that here in stating that these qualitative defects in type 2 uh, are as follows. Type 2A, there's a loss of high molecular weight multimers. Type 2b, there's a gain of function, and that plated binding to von Willebrand factor is such that the plates will tend to aggregate, leading to loss of high molecular weight multimers, but also leading, in many cases, to thrombocytopenia. There's a type 2m, in which there's a plated binding defect uh, in the opposite direction, direction uh, with, regard to, with regard to von Willebrand factor, and a type 2n, <coughs> uh, which stands for n as in Normandy, a defect in factor VIII binding uh, in most cases of such, uh, such a type of von Willebrand's disease, so such that one has a decrease in factor VIII because factor VIII's survival and circulation, as I indicated earlier, depends on its being stabilized by uh, traveling in the circulation associated with von Willebrand factor. When it cannot associate with von Willebrand factor, its half-life will drop from about eight hours to two hours. The von Willebrand factor uh, protein has a number of domains of importance, and this one is where factor VIII binds, and this one is where there's interaction between collagen, glycoprotein 1b, heparin, and the von Willebrand factor, and still another domain where microfibular collagen uh, matters and can bind. Uh, in the previous slide, I also showed that there's more than 300 mutations presently known. Our first case is, involves a 17-year-old young man who arrived in the emergency room with oozing of blood every day for the past nine days. And this, was, this followed extraction of all four of his wisdom teeth. He has a history of frequent nosebleeds, lasting up to 30 minutes. His mother, a maternal aunt, and grandfather also uh, have such nosebleeds. His examination appears to be normal, except for steady oozing of blood from his left posterior lower and upper gingival beds. Blood count is normal, including a platelet count of 313,000. Baseline prothrombin time is also normal, but his baseline prothrombin time is mildly to moderately elevated at 46.7 seconds. The upper limit of normal for our lab is 37 seconds. So what is the differential diagnosis? And if it's early on a Sunday morning, when such cases often happen, uh, definitive laboratory testing is just not available. So one needs to think through the case. Whatever this uh, uh, teenager has has to be uh, transmitted uh, both through women and men, so therefore it's unlikely to be hemophilia A or B. 
and this leaves uh, either von Willebrand's disease uh, or hemophilia C, which is the one hemophilia which is transmitted uh, autosomally, that is through males or females. I think that the odds are heavily that this is von Willebrand's disease, so a very reasonable treatment would be to give a blood product rich in the von Willebrand factor uh, and to provide the, therefore thereby both factor VIII and von Willebrand factor at the same time and relieve the bleeding. If this were not to help, uh, one could then come back with fresh frozen plasma uh, in the unlikely event uh, this child has, uh, has hemophilia C. So treatment of von Willebrand's disease. Uh, first line treatment for those for whom this works is an analog of vasopressin uh, which goes by the uh, acronym DDAVP. DDAVP increases the von Willebrand factor and factor VIII levels two to threefold within 30 minutes of infusion, actually by the end of the infusion, and uh, the effect lasts for six to 12 hours. Not all, but the overall, overwhelming majority of patients who are thought to have von Willebrand's disease respond to it. Uh, other types, especially the type twos, may respond in some cases, but type three disease the, the levels are too low uh, to benefit from the use of DDAVP. It's important that one monitor for hyponatremia because this is a, a medication which has an antidiuretic hormone-like effect and water intoxication can, can become a serious complication, especially if one gives uh, um, much IV fluids, which can happen either in the operating room for surgical coverage uh, or in situations of trauma. Another problem can be tachyphylaxis, that is, the dose, the response to DAVP uh, can attenuate over days, such that you lose a response by day four or day five. The dosing is stated here as 0.3 micrograms per kilogram uh, intravenously and about 50 cc's of normal saline and administered over 30 minutes. That is a safe uh, uh, period of time. In the case I just presented, however, uh, the teenager had not had a diagnosis made in order to trigger testing for DDAVP, so we didn't know whether he would or not respond, and this was the reason why instead of giving him DDAVP, we gave a blood factor concentrate rich in the von Willebrand factor, and four such concentrates are listed here. Humate P, alpha 8, Will 8, and Co8 double virus inactivated. There's a recombinant von Willebrand factor under current study. Uh, dosing the concentrates is given as risk of seed and cofactor activity units per kilogram, and here's an example of a reasonable dose. But it's important to monitor for factor VIII levels because there have been cases where overzealous treatment can lead to a, such high levels of factor VIII that a prothrombotic state and deep venous thrombosis can happen. It's also very effective to combine DDVP with Amicar, which is a, an oral antifibrinolytic agent. That is, it helps you hold on to what clotting you can form and retards the body's uh, wish to, to dissolve clots uh, in order to orchestrate and prevent hemostatic clots from becoming pathologic thrombi. Now, in a differential diagnosis, though, one needs to consider a platelet function defect because these are now increasingly recognized to be almost as common as type 1 von Willebrand's disease. Uh, secondly, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. Uh, Osler Weber Rondu syndrome is another name for this condition. It's associated with arterial venous malformations, actually very small ones, in the skin, uh, viscera, and can occur now, we recognize, in about one in 4,000 persons. And there's distinct genes which can be studied to confirm a diagnosis, the ANG and ALK1 genes being the principal uh, ones. Another condition is known as benign joint hypermobility syndrome. Uh, which goes also by the name of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, associated with defects in the collagen of the integument. And then it's when this one can see a, a persons who have very hyperdistensible joints, skin which can be raised and undergo so-called tenting. There's a clinical scoring system called the Baten score, which can predict the utility of going forward with gene testing. And the genes uh, principally involved include COL or COL3A1, and TNX13, mutations of which give rise to the condition. Now, in hereditary hemorrhagic feeling dictasia, uh, this is an example around the mouth and lips of the small uh, uh, arteriovenous malformations which can occur. Uh, to make a diagnosis, 
in general, one considers uh, nose bleeds, the presence on the skin or the mucosa of these little arteriovenous malformations, GI bleeding, or a family member who is similarly affected. If you have three of the four of these, uh, gene testing is, is, is uh, justified, and one can make a prov provisional diagnosis of HHT. This is a very important condition to recognize because the AVMs can exist in the brain, uh, in the lungs, in the liver, uh, which give rise to the potential for a catastrophic hemorrhage uh, in the future. Another major condition that we see in pediatrics is acute idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, or acute ITP for short. This condition is associated with mucocutaneous bleeding, with onset often following a viral infection. It remits by 6 to 12 months in most of children, in fact, in about 5 out of 6 children. If it lasts for a year or longer, it's considered to be chronic. The bleeding risk is not well predicted by the platelet count. Consider a circulating platelet mass, the so-called thrombocrit, because in ITP, the platelets in children uh, will often be larger, have richer granules, and be more functional uh, for the same number. Uh, that uh, would be the case uh, for someone without ITP. It also is important to note that a uh, low platelet count gives rise to thinning of the endothelium and even breaks in the endothelium, which can themselves predispose to hemorrhage. The mechanism for its formation is rapid clearance of platelets, which are coated with an antiplatelet antibody by the reticular endothelial cell system. The pathophysiology involves, more recently, the recognition of a thrombopoietin or TPO receptor, which uh, uh, thrombopoietin acts on on the megakaryocyte to stimulate the production of platelets. Uh, antibodies against the platelet, which attack the megakaryocyte, the, the source of platelets, as well as the platelet directly, and lymphocytes, particularly T lymphocytes, which can attack the platelet and the megakaryocyte. And with enough uh, injury, uh, megakaryocytes can undergo apoptosis, which adds to the burden of ITP, failure of some production, let alone increased destruction of platelets by autoimmune mechanisms. And thrombus, the thrombocytopenia of ITP, unlike the slide I showed you of a normal peripheral blood smear, can show rather large platelets. Uh, here's a very one which is similar in size to a red cell, in fact. And other platelets exceed a quarter of the red cell diameter are also large. The total number of platelets is generally few, and fewer, in fact, than this uh, high power uh, micrograph would indicate. Here's the endothelium of a rabbit and a rabbit model of ITP, where an antibody has been introduced uh, in, the, uh, in some of the rabbits to reduce uh, platelet counts to less than 5,000. Normal rabbit platelet count is about 450,000. In the top is a normal endothelium with a normal platelet count, the endothelial wall being about a micron in thickness. In the lower, in the presence of severe thrombocytopenia, uh, the, the endothelium is thinned to less than half its original thickness, and there are some areas where there's frank breaks or fenestrations. So one can see hemorrhage in severe, severe th thrombocytopenia results from lock, last block loss of uh, vascular integrity and not just because of the low platelet count. Current therapeutic approaches to ITP include reducing the production of antibody that causes the red cell, or rather platelet destruction, uh, removing the splenic site of clearance, that is splenectomy, reducing uh, FC receptor mediated clearance uh, by the antibody uh, through the RE system, and increasing platelet production. And the first category includes steroids, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, and the anti-CD20 uh, antibody rituximab. Cyclosporin and mycophenolate are additional agents. Removing the site of clearance, that is, the spleen is reserved for only for chronic refractory ITP and generally not considered uh, until you're well beyond a year of having the condition. Reducing clearance uh, by the RE system, steroids again can help accomplish this, as does immune globulin, IVIG, and a, uh, another version of this is anti-D immune globulin, <clears throat> which sensitizes a cohort of red cells to uh, become destroyed in lieu of uh, platelets. So you sacrifice a, a small fraction of your red blood cells in order to spare platelets, which you can hardly spare. Danosol also can achieve this uh, general aim. But the, mo the most recent treatment that's appeared is the use of t agents, 
uh, including El Trombo Pog and Romney Postum, which we'll hear more about in, in a few minutes. But steroids and Dapson are other agents which can include or stimulate platelet production. Now, my, my approach to ITP is as follows. <clears throat> if there's a bleeding or a need for surgery, uh, play the count less than 50,000 would justify an intervention. Um, if there's purpura or confluent petechiae, which is suggestive of imminent severe bleeding, I would treat for a platelet count of less than or equal to 20,000. But without any evidence of bleeding or even just scattered petechiae, a low platelet count, um, I usually don't treat unless the platelet count is below 10,000 and sometimes between 10 and 20,000. And there are many people in, in our country who don't treat at all but rather observe uh, with just a low platelet count without evidence of significant bleeding. Initially, I would use either intravenous gamma globulin or anti-D. However, with anti-D, one must be Coombs negative, that is DAT negative. Otherwise, life-threatening hemolysis can, res can result. And one has to be Rh positive for the red cells to become sensitized by the anti-D to run interference, so to speak, and salvage uh, and prevent platelet loss. I personally do not use anti-D for very young children under age three uh, because of the existence of occasional major hemolytic reactions even in children who are Coombs negative. IV gamma globulin plus steroids offers the fastest response in my experience. And we generally reserve the use of rituximab or romiplastum or trombopog, these are the two tipo mimetics, for ITP which lasts longer than six months. Case two, <clears throat> have a three-year-old little girl who presents with a platelet count of 4,000 and body-wide petechiae. The remainder of her blood counts are within normal limits, and her exam revealed some shoddy lymphadenopathy, but no hepatosplenomegaly. What workup and treatment do you recommend? Well, the biggest part of the differential diagnosis here is actually acute leukemia, which is why the comment about lack of an enlarged spleen or liver. And, uh, and the fact that the lymph nodes are not uh, abnormal. Uh, it's unusual to have leukemia with a platelet count of 4,000, that is such a low platelet count, and with other normal counts. Nonetheless, I like to look at a peripheral blood smear to be sure uh, that I'm dealing with an immune diagnosis, an immune cytopenia type of diagnosis. Having uh, become comfortable that this is not a case of acute leukemia, I then turn my attention to uh, ITP versus a condition called Evans syndrome versus a condition called um, autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, all of which are associated with immune cytopenias. Uh, I won't discuss the latter two in much detail because, because of the scope of the present talk. Uh, however, uh, the latter two do involve a positive Coombs test, that is, with the ability of uh, other antibodies against cells to be present, and the treatment is quite different. Nonetheless, if we have a negative Coombs test uh, and uh, a physical examination and blood counts which, are, which point away from leukemia and away from Evans syndrome or, or ELPS, uh, the diagnosis by exclusion is generally ITP. While awaiting the results of our initial blood test, this little girl suffers a major nosebleed, controlled only by maintaining local pressure over her nose. What do we do next? Well, the fact that she had a major nosebleed suggests that she has a little greater bleeding risk. She's demonstrating that in front of us. A little greater bleeding risk is someone who just has a low platelet count. So in her case, I would move to giving her gamma globulin and steroids because I can get a rather rapid response. But what if I had a child who was irritable, perhaps even losing consciousness, uh, or a child who could tell me she had a severe headache? one needs to consider intracranial hemorrhage, which is a true emergency in ITP. Well, then one needs to transfuse platelets, even random platelets, uh, give decadron to help control brain edema, but also to help raise the platelet count uh, urgently, and immune gamma globulin to help prevent uh, uh, the, or blunt some of the uh, destruction of the platelets going on in, in her own system, that is of her own platelets. I uh, re request the emergency CT scan or MR if that was equally uh, available in, in, uh, in a rapid uh, uh, time, and call pediatric surgery for consideration for an urgent splenectomy. A splenectomy is a way of uh, 
allowing the play of the count to surge and rise quite rapidly because in ITP, a large proportion of the body's platelets are sequestered in the spleen. That's also true in normal people, but more so even in, in someone with ITP. And finally, we would need to alert neurosurgery for possible uh, decompressive craniectomy if there's significant hemorrhage causing mass effect. Now, a word on uh, a tipo mimetic. Uh, the, the two major tipo mimetics today are ramiplostum and l thrombopog and their mechan uh, mechanism of action is to act on the thrombopoietin receptor in such a way as to stimulate signaling through the megakaryocyte cell membrane uh, via the STAT, JAK, and NAP kinase pathways leading to increased platelet production. One, in it, one, might, one might also need to consider, however, in the differential diagnosis, an alternative uh, type of immune thrombocytopenia prevalent in a newborn. Uh, there's two types of neonatal immune thrombocytopenia of, of interest and of concern. The so-called MYH9 macrothrombocytopenias, which have gained recent attention, and other congenital thrombocytopenias. Drug effects occur and DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulation. Here's a child with neonatal immune thrombocytopenia uh, from a mother having ITP and her antibodies crossing the placenta to destroy her infants. This condition is, is about as serious as ITP. That is, serious bleeding is infrequent, but it does happen. Probably the serious bleeding numbering the one in uh, two to 300 cases. But neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia, or NAIT, is quite serious in that this condition is associated with uh, fetal platelets containing an antigen uh, inherited from the father that the mother lacks. A minor or even a major fetal maternal hemorrhage triggers the mother's uh, body to create antibody which can cross back across the placenta, causing fetal thrombocytopenia. The most common antigen among Caucasians is so-called HPA1 that the mother lacks and the fetus and the father both have. Now, why this is a potentially devastating condition is that 15 to 20 percent of cases involve intracranial hemorrhage, either just before or at the time of birth. Uh, and, and a few fewer cases uh, post-birth. And the reason for this is that the antibody not only lowers platelet number, but also affects platelet function by binding to an epitope on glycoprotein, T, glycoprotein 2B, which as we have seen is part of the, of the fibrinogen receptor. This impairs platelet function. Prevalence is about one to two per thousand births. The treatment is to give HPA1 negative platelets, gamma globulin, uh, and to, if, if uh, such platelets are not available, to consider random platelets or even platelets from mother's sister, uh, which often are PA, uh, HPA1 negative as well. <clears throat> the MYH9 related platelet disorders are macrothrombocytopenias, that is, the platelets are large, uh, but they're important because they can be associated with renal failure at some point in life, hearing loss, and pre senile cataracts. This is a disorder of non-muscle myosin heavy chain 2A, which is a cytoskeletal, cytoskeletal contractile protein found in the platelet. Inheritance is autosomal dominant in most cases, although it can be X-linked. Therefore, in distinguishing this condition from ITP, it can be very helpful uh, to study family members and see whether any of the family members, uh, first degree relatives, also have thrombocytopenia. The spectrum of the MYH9 disorders includes uh, what has been called uh, previously Mayhegelin anomaly, Epstein syndrome, Fechner syndrome, and Sebastian syndrome. Here's an example where the platelets are rather large compared to the red cells in MYH9. Uh, there are also in the leukocytes can be clumps of uh, the myosin protein, uh, abnormally distributed, therefore in clumps. Here's an, a special stain against the MYH9 uh, uh, muscle protein, showing its diffuse presence in this leukocyte, but its clumpy presence in this abnormal leukocyte characteristic of MYH9. So a review, a review of peripheral blood smear and looking for such inclusions in the leukocytes uh, helps to make the diagnosis, in addition to noting uh, large platelets and the presence in other family members of a low platelet count. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, 
uh, involves generally an ill-appearing child, an elevated prothrombin time, and partial thromboplastin time, low platelet count, a hemolytic anemia in which the red cells are fragmented, called a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and it's often driven by an infectious uh, agent. Here's the red cells looking to torn appearance. These are called schistocytes or helmet cells. And the child who has a, such a condition can have large areas of necrosis uh, and purpura. The last major uh, diagnosis to consider today is hemophilia. Historically, <clears throat> uh, there are many references in the Bible and in the uh, literature uh, to the presence of, of inherited bleeding conditions. And in the uh, Talmud of the second century, it was taught by the Tamaim, if she circumcised her first son and he died, and a second son and he died, she must not circumcise a third one. <clears throat> I personally would have observed this after the second child and not waited, uh, but it does show the importance uh, in our history. Now, the hemophilias A and B are clinically indistinguishable. Hemophilia A, which affects one in 10,000 males, and hemophilia B, one in 25,000 males, are both hereditary bleeding disorders characterized by a decrease or absence of coagulation factor eight or nine, and account for more than 90% of all cases of severe congenital bleeding disorders. Other disorders one thinks about are von Willebrand's disease and factor 11 deficiency, otherwise known as hemophilia C, uh, which is present uh, uh, throughout the European population, but especially among uh, uh, Ashkenazi Jews. Its incidence is variable, but thought to be about one in 500,000 uh, persons. It tends to be uh, milder hemophilia, uh, and other factor deficiencies are, are rather rare. Levels of factor eight or nine in hemophilia are, are, are as, as follows. Severe hemophilia means an undetectable level, less than 1%, moderate, two to 5%, mild, six to 40%. Uh, at least 30% of all hemophiliacs in the United States have mild or moderate disease, uh, many being unaware that they have the disease at all. The differential diagnosis of hemophilia A includes the more severe forms of von Willebrand's disease, that is types 2N and 3, uh, hemophilia B or C, acquired hemophilia, which is an autoimmune condition and rather rare, and an even more rare condition known as combined factor 5 and factor 8 deficiency. The factor eight molecule has a molecular weight of about 265,000 Daltons. It's a single chain protein. It circulates complex to von Willebrand factor, which I said earlier, extends its half-life from two hours to eight hours, allowing this level to rise uh, to levels seen physiologically. It has a certain concentration in plasma. It also binds to the plated membrane as to uh, all the activated clotting factors and forming complexes to drive coagulation. Here's an example from our work. Well, in flowing blood, uh, the green objects represent platelets and platelet aggregates. We've labeled factor eight, recombinant factor eight, added to the blood of a hemophiliac uh, who has a very low level of endogenous factor eight. We've labeled the factor eight <coughs> with uh, a red label. And the red label, when it co-localizes to the platelet, appears yellow. We see no free red but rather a large proportion of the plated membrane is, is yellow, indicating a high degree of co-localization, which we interpret to be binding a factor eight to the blood platelet. There's, there are principles we observe in providing, diagnose, uh, providing factor dosing to a patient. What is our desired factor level? If one had a severe hemorrhage, one would like to get to 100%. If one had a minor bleed, 15 or 20% might suffice. A second issue is what is the recovery of the factor? One unit per kilogram of factor eight generally raises the plasma level by 2%. So to go to 100%, one would need to use 50 units per kilogram. Factor nine, on the other hand, uh, one unit per kilogram raises the plasma level by about 1%. And then the half-life of the factor determines the frequency of dosing. The factor eight having a half-life of eight to 12 hours, these one to usually chose, choose uh, dosing of every 12 hours. Factor nine with a half-life of 18 to 24 hours leads one to choose a dosing of about every 24 hours. So in case three, we have a 16-year-old, 16-month-old rather, with severe hemophilia A, and uh, who has uh, had a diagnosis based on easy bruising and an increased partial thromboplastin time. 
at the time of the event we're about to describe, he was on so-called demand therapy. He had never had a major bleed, and we usually uh, treat uh, as necessary at this stage. A maternal great-great-grandfather had hemophilia in Spain, so this family history is remote, but it wasn't lost in the family. At age 16 months, he fell onto the back of his head from a stroller onto a floor at a shopping mall. Uh, parents uh, did not think much of this and did not call for medical assistance. But four days later, he began to have se uh, emesis, which progressed to seizures the following day and decreased responsiveness. He was infused factor eight at an outside hospital and transferred to our center. An MR of the brain showed intracerebellar, intracerebellar hemorrhage with edema and obstructive hydrocephalus. He had a drain placed and a neurosurgical decompression. The common factor eight was given for three and a half weeks with trough levels to exceed 40% and peak levels exceeding 100%. Uh, he's been on a so-called tailored infusion therapy, keeping his levels uh, in the trough range above 1%, along with the helmet while an active toddler. And he's done well and has actually recovered quite well. On his initial brain MR, you could see a large area of the cerebellum on both T1 and axial T2 weighted images, uh, which show hemorrhage, confirmed an axial susceptibility weighted image where the darkness indicates blood. In severe hemophilia A or B, it's important to secure the airway, manage, manage seizures, and stabilize your patient otherwise. If there's no high titer inhibitor against factor, a problem area which is also a challenge, uh, or the status of inhibitors unknown, one infuse, uh, infuses sufficient factor A to raise your level to 100%, but then check a superstat PTT to confirm that you've corrected uh, the clotting system. A factor A level is hard to obtain uh, on such short notice, so we, although we request one, we depend on a PTT for real-time decision making. An emergency head CT scan or MR if it's available in a timely fashion. MR, that is, with susceptibility, will also suffice. If there's hemorrhage, we give Decadron, called neurosurgery, to consider decompressive craniectomy, at least to follow the patient, and continue full replacement therapy for weeks, following trough levels of factor eight to ensure that we're at the 40% level in terms of the trough measurements. Joint bleeds also occur, <clears throat> and here's a bleed, a severe bleed into the knee. Uh, especially susceptible are the hinge joints, the ankles, the elbows, but also uh, the knees, the uh, hips, and the uh, uh, ankles. <clears throat> Iron deposition from the bleeding uh, is one of the factors which drives proliferation of synovium, complicating uh, the functionality of limbs, as well as uh, leading to destruction of the bony uh, interfaces at the joint. <clears throat> Standard management of hemarthroses include replacing clotting factor that's deficient, joint immobilization for a period of days, analgesics, uh, but not usually joint aspiration. We reserve this only to very large bleeds which could benefit uh, aspiration and if the aspiration is performed rather quickly. We start factor prophylaxis uh, after the first major bleed, which means giving factor every other day or at least three times a week to uh, uh, prevent the complications of further major bleeds. The value and utility of doing this was established in a landmark study uh, presented by and published by Dr. Marilyn Michael Johnson in 2007. But in a differential, one may also need to consider, of course, hemophilia C, uh, but there's three other conditions I generally screen for, which are rare. Factor 13 deficiency, which does not show up in a prolongation of either the prothrombin time or the partial thromboplastin time. <clears throat> a dysfibrinogenemia, which means a fibrinogen which is not functional, screened for by a thrombin time, <clears throat> and, and finally a condition called plasminogen activator 1 deficiency, which is an overactive fibrinolysis caused by a deficiency of a regulator of fibrinolysis called plasminogen activator 1. This condition, unfortunately, does not have a good um, laboratory test at the present time. I'm hoping that will change. Bleeding and trauma. <clears throat> Uh, is important uh, because it demonstrates some other aspects of coagulation, meaning not all depends on an intact clotting system. Trauma is the leading cause of death worldwide among persons between ages 5 and 44. Uncontrolled bleeding and trauma still contributes to 30 to 40 percent of trauma-related deaths and is the leading cause of preventable early in-hospital deaths. <clears throat> 
and this uh, uh, data from uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, morbidity and mortality reporting, we see that in the year 2005, the leading cause of death, once again, is motor vehicle traffic and trauma, and a large percentage of these deaths are from hemorrhage. Bleeding and trauma, massive bleeding and trauma patients, is generally caused by a combination of vascular injury, disruption, severing of vessels and limbs, uh, blunt trauma, which can lead to large uh, uh, to hemorrhage uh, within a, an organ, and coagulopathy. But the coagulopathy is multifactorial. <clears throat> uh, anemia contributes to it. As we saw earlier, the presence of red cells is important for hemostasis. Acidosis, hypothermia, hypoxia, hypocalcemia, and deletion and depletion of clotting factors also play a major role because one needs uh, <clears throat> a normal pH, euthermia, a normal uh, oxygen tension, normal levels of ionized calcium, and normal quantities of clotting factors to make clotting uh, work properly. Bleeding and trauma, therefore, is promoted by anemia, acidosis, hypothermia, hypoxia, and hypocalcemia. And, and the clinical outcomes, therefore, uh, are much affected by our ability to respond and correct to uh, these problems. The outcomes, therefore, reflect the actual hematocrit and platelet count one can achieve in treating a patient. Uh, ability to raise the temperature to uh, normal body levels of 37 degrees, correction of acidosis in a prompt manner, and correction of hypoxia and hypocalcemia. There are a number of principles one observes in massive transfusion support, which goes along with this. But again, a big emphasis is placed on correcting the parameters I just enumerated, but also giving platelets for every so many units of blood cells, since current red blood cells do not contain plasma. Uh, and providing missing fibrinogen, if the fibrinogen level falls sufficiently low, below about 80 milligrams per deciliter, using a product called cryoprecipitate, which is very rich in fibrinogen. In summary, common genetic bleeding disorders of childhood do include von Willebrand disease and the hemophilias. Acute ITP, although not generally considered genetic, is also an important disorder. Von Willebrand disease is generally mild, but serious bleeding is possible with tonsillectomy and dental surgery. Von Willebrand disease can exacerbate menorrhagia in girls and women. Acute ITP is managed with anti-D, intravenous gammaglobulin, and or steroids. Newer treatments include rituximab and tepomimetics. Life-threatening bleeding is uncommon, but does occur. Severe hemophilia A or B typically first becomes symptomatic in the toddler years, when a toddler is walking and has opportunity to fall, uh, strike himself against a hard object. Bleeding with head trauma is the greatest threat to life, but hemarthrosis and the development of inhibitors to clotting factors can severely limit quality of life and remain challenges today. Bleeding management and trauma uh, gives rise to the observation that it's important to improve circulation, uh, to provide effective transfusion support, and to consider even antifibrinolytic therapy early on, and to monitor the key parameters which will help us to assess to what level we have restored adequate hemostasis. And above all, by restoring normal circulation, as well as missing coagulation factors, red blood cells, and platelets.